I would like to begin by thanking everyone for attending today and thanking the TLRC for inviting me to speak about supporting struggling learners and learning and students with learning disabilities in the classroom. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Dr. Lauren Foxworth. I am currently an assistant professor in exceptional education and learning department. I am responsible for teaching two courses on um, teaching students um, with learning disabilities and also supervising student teachers who are seeking certification in special education. Although I'm a new professor here at Old Westbury, I have experience teaching similar courses at Penn State University and am a certified special education teacher with experience teaching students with disabilities at the secondary level. So the goals for today's OWLS talk include briefly discussing and defining learning disabilities. In addition, I will highlight a few research-based instructional methods that can be effective for supporting struggling learners and students with learning disabilities. It is important for me to note that not all of these methods will necessarily work for your specific content area, course, or classroom, or your students. Um, many of them may not even agree with your style of teaching at the second or at the higher education level. I merely wish to provide several instructional strategies with hope that perhaps one or two can be useful to you when working with struggling learners. So before discussing strategies for supporting students with LD in academic areas, it is important to define LD. The term specific learning disability means a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using language, spoken or written, uh, which disorder may manifest itself in imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, spell, write, or do mathematical calculations. In other words, these students have difficulty storing, processing, or producing information, oftentimes in a specific content area. Although the disability may affect one specific content area, the disability can easily manifest across other academic areas. If, for example, a mathematics problem has heavily word-based directions, the student with a specific LD in reading may have difficulty comprehending what is being asked of them. However, that student may have the knowledge to solve that problem with ease. This is why we often see accommodations across all courses. So as strong teachers, it is our job to use effective research-based instructional practice to enable students with disabilities and struggling learners to achieve highest levels of success. So here at Old Westbury, approximately 180 students are diagnosed with disabilities. One third of these are diagnosed with LD. The other two thirds struggle in academic areas due to um, ADD, ADHD, or mental illness. Students diagnosed with a disability at the higher education level often receive accommodations including extended time for examinations, um, examinations provided in a, in a quiet area, among other accommodations. The caveat is that these students need to voluntarily disclose their disability to OSSD to document their disability, and they need to voluntarily, again, disclose their disability to each professor. This process is very different from the K-12 environment and can be quite frightening as this is often the first time students need to come forward and self-advocate. So what can we do as professors to support our struggling learners and learners with LD in addition to the required accommodations? So what else can we do to break the spell and help our struggling learners achieve success? So here are a few basic, effective, research-based instructional methods for increasing success of struggling learners. So in designing a lesson, it's helpful to begin with a strong introduction to frame the lesson's purpose and ensure that students have the prerequisite skills needed to learn new content. So gaining attention is an important component of an introduction as gaining attention helps students clearly understand it's time to stop texting and start focusing. Stating the goal of the lesson also helps the struggling learner focus on the main idea of the lesson and the critical content of a lesson. If necessary, an introduction might include verification of prerequisite skills. 
For example, it would save me time to verify understanding of common core state standards before spending a class period discussing and debating advantages and disadvantages of common core for students with disabilities. It may also be helpful to establish relevance of the lesson to help struggling learners make real life connections to increase motivation and also to increase the probability of students using that content in the future. A closing is also a good routine, um, good routine support for struggling learners. It does not take much time to close a lesson, but closing can assist students a great deal in processing new information if a quick review is provided with a preview of what's to come next. Increased engagement in the lesson leads to increased success. Asking questions helps teachers keep students engaged and verify understanding of the content. If we think about who participates most in our lessons, it's likely not our struggling learners. Those who volunteer most often are those who have experienced repeated success sharing their answers. Our struggling learners have often experienced repeated failure in the classroom and may be less likely to volunteer. So how can we get our struggling learners more engaged and involved in delivering our lessons? Oops, sorry. Um, first, it might be helpful to call on non-volunteers if the question is based on academic content. If we only call on volunteers, we often get a skewed image of the effectiveness of our instruction. In other words, although the top three students understand and have answered questions correctly, the others may be lost. Using non-volunteers helps teachers understand whether they need to adjust their instruction and increase clarity. Of course, calling on non-volunteers is not appropriate for personal experience or opinion type questions. Additionally, we can use a think-pair-share activity to engage all learners. For this method of questioning, a teacher might pose a question, allow individual think time, direct students to chat with a partner, and then call on a non-volunteer after that to respond to the question. This method can increase confidence uh, for struggling learners and keep students more engaged in the lesson. Fishing for answers occurs when several students provide an incorrect answer and then we fish around for the correct answer. If we repeat an incorrect answer too many times, processing the correct answer could become more difficult for the struggling learner. For this reason, it is best to limit fishing and instead prompt or support an incorrect student in determining the procedure or the correct procedure or answer. Last, providing an appropriate amount of wait time after a question is posed can provide all learners, including those with processing difficulties, the opportunity to actively engage in any cognitive conflict posed throughout a lecture. Without adequate wait time, only the quickest processors will be able to actively participate in answering the question, while others may still be processing the question. Students with disabilities and struggling learners may be more likely to lose focus during a lesson. So to support attentive behavior, we might use proximity control by casually moving toward the inattentive student, or we could pose a question um, by which all students need to respond, either verbally or in writing. So we may also ask, all right, show me with a thumbs up, thumbs down near your tummy, how well are you understanding this content right now? It is best to avoid calling on inattentive students. Doing so may end up wasting your instructional time because if a student has not been paying attention, he or she is likely not going to know the answer. So calling on that inattentive student could also negatively impact your teacher-student rapport. Self-monitoring occurs when an individual self-assesses whether or not a behavior has occurred and then self-records the results. Self-monitoring can be particularly helpful in supporting students with disabilities when writing. If, for example, there are particular components of a paper or behaviors during writing you would like to encourage, 
You can write each of these out and have the student complete a checklist while writing. It is important to monitor the work of students with disabilities and struggling learners. As my advisor, Dr. Charles Hughes, used to say, practice makes permanent, not perfect. So it's helpful to monitor responses in class so that students do not complete an entire mathematics assignment incorrectly or apply a concept inaccurately. If this happens, students need to unlearn the incorrect information before relearning the new information making the learning process even more difficult. If errors have been made, it is sometimes helpful to analyze error patterns made by one specific student or error patterns made by the class. This can inform teachers about what information specifically was delivered in the clearest manner. Analyzing error patterns can take grading and providing feedback to a higher level of effectiveness because adjustment of instruction based on this data can help support student success. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and thank you again to the TLRC for this opportunity.